Hi, my name is Ben Coombs, and you're watching the Glumberger Channel. Time to review Black One by Sun today. Come on! Hello there, and welcome to Weird Music on the Bl Glumberger channel. <laughs> Huge thanks to Ben for sorting out our introduction there. <laughs> you know, this is the show where, you know, we look at weird and unusual albums of all sorts, taking you know, little dives into what they're all about, yeah? <laughs> and so, yeah, as, as you now know, uh, we're looking at a band who's probably, you know, well overdue for inclusion on the show, considering that, you know, the second episode of Weird Music was a dive into the wonderful world of Earth, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, in consideration of that, I find it... I, I'm very surprised with myself that it's taken this long to finally talk about Sun, but alas, we got there in the end. Um, the other thing as well that, you know, I'm very surprised that this was the album I'm starting with, but this is one where all the thoughts just came out, you know, but I want to talk about a lot of different Sun albums, but we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. Today I present, you know, one of Sun's most ambitious and very eclectic records within their wonderful discography, the 2005 album Black One. And so, and so, as we do at these points in the videos, let's ask ourselves, who are Sun? <laughs> well, Sun is an experimental drone metal band from Seattle, Washington, comprised mostly by members Stephen O'Malley and Greg Anderson. And across their career, Sun have produced a wide range of different albums exploring the world of drone metal, taking incredibly low guitar tunings and playing the absolute slowest of riffs with absolute incredibly loud fuzzed out and distorted guitars that completely enveloped you in this doomy metal ambience. No, I feel like so much of what Sun do is just, you know, further building upon the world established by Earth, you know, and of, you know, and of course, like it should be said, the band's been a huge influence on Stephen O'Malley and Greg Anderson, you know, with them, you know, even going as far to name a previous project of theirs, Teeth of the Lions Rule the Divine, you know, a name taken straight out of Earth 2's special low frequency version. And let's also not forget the inclusion of a track named Dylan Carson on the band's first recorded album, The Grim Robes Demos. <laughs> In any case though, in any case though, um, whilst Earth started to explore post-rock and blues in their later albums, it seems that Sun instead just really further explored the world of metal drone music, you know, just pushing up these colossal walls of noise and just, you know, singular distorted guitar tones just ring out for an eternity across these absurdly lengthy runtimes. It's so... It's just so brilliant to listen to, and it's incredibly, you know, audacious and bombastic in its presentation, but so brilliantly performed, I think. And so, today's episode you know, has us looking at Black One, which is a rather interesting album within Sun's discography, as it sees them pushing out their, their usual style of ambient drum metal, but they also really incorporate it with in many black metal influences, as well as including, you know, a number of black metal guests, of course. And as a result, though, you get what is, you know, one of the band's darkest and moodiest records within their discography. Um, uh, and it's definitely one that's very different to the incredibly abstract drones that you're used to from the band. But it's one that's still, you know, just an incredible record in its own right, of course. And I'm excited to talk about this one, but I, sh I should say here, though, my understanding of black metal as a genre is incredibly limited, I'm sorry. Um, 
I think I think my only instances of listening to like black metal that I can remember, like especially in sort of early years and stuff, is listening to an early Alva album. It might have even been the very first album by Alva, but. It is a genre I'm actually trying to explore a bit more of these days. I'm actually, you know, finally, fi finally starting to find little things I like within the genre. And so, yeah, we might discuss more on the channel in the future. <laughs> but let's get back to the album, though. Let's get back to us. Uh, Black One offers us seven tracks from some. You know, a track listing that's definitely longer than previous albums that, you know, feature only one, two, or three songs, right? But generally, no, that should generally be expected from the band, of course. <laughs> In any case though, Black One opens up rather differently to you know, any sub record that I've come across, you know, with this incredibly short two minute drone called Sin Nana. It's an incredibly low murky rumble of deep intense notes and various effects, you know, that travel across the various channels. And it's a delightful introduction to the very album itself though as it creates this really foreboding atmosphere for us, you know, pulling us straight into the, you know, the middle of the darkness as you know, you're just stood there outside the cave, peering into that ever-deepening black that's slowly pulling us further and further in. And I should say here that, you know, many of the kind of ambient effects, I would call them, that occur in this track come from the one and only Oro Armbachi, one of Sun's frequent collaborators whose low-end tones just work so absurdly well alongside Sun's monolithic drones, you know? And it results in this incredibly short but truly delightful track that really just pulls you into the dark, you know, the darkness, the blackness of it all. <laughs> and it's a perfect lead into what I would say is probably one of my favourite tracks by Sun. And that is track two, It Took the Night to Believe. <laughs> so this one. This is where you get to hear, I would say, you know, the most influences from the black metal genre, I would say, you know, you've got this very peculiar little guitar line, though peculiar for some at the very least, that's almost vibrating across this little ascending and descending riff, you know, backed up by these incredibly heavy chugging guitars. <laughs> and what's amazing here is how heavy the guitars sound, you know, you know, they're so tuned so low that, you know, they sound almost like bass guitars with their you know, rather than guitars themselves. But there is no doubt in my mind, though, that one of the, mo one of the main focal points of this, of this track, though, is the incredibly intense, guttural performance from uh, one Jeff Whitehead performing the vocals, uh, also known as Rest, from the black metal project Leviathan. And I'll say here, a rather controversial individual who, ha who was uh, charged with sexual assault and domestic violence, though, which, you know, not cool, so I'm mentioning it here because I think it's important to know these things. Um, maybe I'll get flagged for that, but whatever, whatever. But regardless though, uh, it's an incredible vocal performance he does though. It's just so guttural, such a proper growl in the lowest register accompanied by these deathly howls that just echo across the night sky. And I think it's a truly phenomenal track as a result. And it's so, so black so heavy and so much different to what one would expect from Sun, I would argue. From here though, from here though, um, I would say the album starts to enter much more familiar territory for Sun, you know, although they do so much experimentation within their own style, though, it's very interesting. <laughs> but you get the, uh, the 10 minute long Cursed Realms of the Winter Demons which is a very windy echoing drone track that just pushes along with this incredibly stark and cold atmosphere. You know, and it's wonderfully credited on the album as well. <laughs> um, so this track uh, features a very peculiar vocal performance from one Scott Malefic Connor, who performs music under the project of Zathur. I think that might be how it's said, I'm not too sure. But anyway. This is another phenomenal vocal performance though that really utilizes you know, the black metal style of screeching and screaming by straining the voice into this incredibly thinly layered vocal that just perfectly intertwines amongst the howling winds that this track is offering us. And it's interjected only by the most intense rumbling of incredibly dense sounding drones that just ring out with this incredibly low end presence though. And I have to say, it is such a miasma of a track that just pulls you into that, you know, dark foreboding landscape, you know, it's that the whole album is presenting, to be fair. And 
I would say this is I, most of the tracks are my favorites to be fair but this is another one of my absolute favorites though because I just love the atmosphere on this one you know it just like standing in the middle of a blizzard there's a demonic otherworldly voice that's just howling in the dead of the night just struggling to even be heard amongst the chaos out there but let's move on let's move on um we come to track four orthodox caveman which is another 10 minute drone excursion of extreme darkness which apparently used to be named uh, caveman salad during the live white tour and so this one i find rather interesting as the very tones themselves are uh, being achieved on the guitar it reminds me so much of that incredibly low-end chuggy sound of earth 2 special low frequency version especially when you know that little riff you know does its thing at the beginning on this one you know and much of the song proceeds, you know, with this very metal riff, I would argue, you know, backed up by the building tumultuous feedback of ringing from the other guitar, just droning away as the notes just climb into the circuitry of the pedal board, you know, oscillating and whining away for however long it wants to, right? <laughs> but I enjoy the presence of this particular track, though, like how the drones themselves sound, which is incredibly loud and metallic, actually, as the pedals just do their work. Um, I think it's a wonderful moment of just pure amplifier worship and just indulgent dirge we need to the doomy drone, I would say. It's a truly brilliant track in my opinion. And it should be mentioned as well though um, that resident member Oren Mbarchi uh, performs drums on this one, which it ends up being this really weird syncopated cymbal pattern, you know, as opposed to the monolithic slow doomy crawl that, you know, one might expect from this genre. And I think it's interesting because it comes you know, it's a very, very, very peculiar little moment on the album that highlights itself, I would say, because it's so different. Um, and it seems to draw together a bit more sense between the combination of the black metal star and the drone metal star. But perhaps, you no, know, I would argue maybe this one's paying tribute to the one and only Dylan Carlson, right? Maybe so, but pure speculation, pure speculation. <laughs> anyway, anyway, from here, uh, we move on to the next track of Candle Goat and eight minute, uh, minutes of peculiar atmospheres as you get these, you know, a peculiar little riff that's accompanied by the grinding gears of lo-fi distortion <laughs> before the heavy electrics just overtake the entire proceedings, you know, with that quintessential doom drone. And I love that, you know, how long that heavy, dense heavy note occurs for it. Oh, it's just swirling and swirling as you enter the dark realms. Of, you know, and this one just feels like classic sun know for the most part no, there's absurdly dense drones that ring out forever and ever when it, well, you know with it become this incredibly hypnotizing experience that just lulls you with its almost overwhelming tones right but that is until you get to the you know the incredibly dark and guttural vocal performance from malefic once again and you know across the whole album i really enjoy malefic's vocal contributions though as his voice just has this really sparse empty style to it right and it's just it just comes across as so ghostly so foggy and peculiar and yet it's such a perfect accompaniment to these really heavy you know drones that some are offering and i think you know, it's a perfect blending of the heavy doom doom drone stylings that some are known for and they're contrasting it you know with the core concepts and ideas from the black metal genre and they never clash in any way, I feel, on this album. It just all comes together so harm harmoniously and creates this really unique yet wonderful listening to experience to us. Moving right along, moving right along, um, we arrive at Cry for the Weeper, which is 14 and a half minutes of roughly continuing dense drones, right? <laughs> And I love the opening of this one though. Um, you're getting these incredibly low end, you know, drones again, you know, um, that I, I would assume would be from Oren Ambachi. And I'll discuss a bit more on why I think that on the next track though, uh, why I think these, these particular sounds are from him. But anyway, anyway, this one opens up so incredibly slowly though, like, like most of them, right? Uh, as you just get these rumbling drones accompanied by the creaking of the of one of the instruments that makes it sound like just the largest door slowly swinging open. <laughs> but I love the atmosphere on this one, like I've done so many of them as well though, like it's just so chilling to listen to and it really takes its time to establish the entire setting and overall ambience. And, uh, and it does of course get to those heavy dense electric drones though, sounding so quintessentially like sun 
But what I love is when the riff comes in. <laughs> and, you know, you know, it's been playing on the other instruments up to this point. It's accompanied by this really peculiar swirling of notes in the background as it just proceeds, you know, and it makes the whole thing sound so incredibly intimidating, as though we're witnessing something truly otherworldly and purely existential. And I would argue this, but maybe those more familiar with the black metal genre can tell me if this is correct or incorrect, but I feel like, you know, as we've traversed to this side of the album, you know, the album seems to have strayed away from the, you know, the black metal openings of tracks like It Took the Night to Believe, and instead it opted for these much more abstract, doomy drone compositions that, you know, to me, I feel like they're instead just continuing the vibes that one gets from listening to black metal which is, you know, just pure overwhelming darkness. Now, I, I don't know if that's correct, because like I said, I don't know much about the black metal genre, but that's a sense I get. And I think people who know the black metal genre can tell me if that's correct or incorrect. If it's incorrect, that's fair. But yeah, I'm just, it's just what came across to me. I just, you know, I might be wrong. But it's, you know, like I said, what I thought though. Um, like, it's just the sense I get that, you know, it seems to be exploring the, the notions of the black metal genre within the very framework of doom metal. Um, so yeah, just, I'd like to know if that, if, if, if there's any credence to that. If not, then it is what it is. But regardless though, regardless, I think it all culminates so brilliantly, right, on this album though. And I love the build up, you know, from the very opening track to, you know, uh, to this very point, as it makes Cry for the, uh, the Weeper this incredibly intimidating and existential track as a result and you know, a very good one it, it's very oh, like overbearing but it's very cool <laughs> and so and so we move on to the very final track of black one 16 minutes to close off the phenomenal this, this phenomenal album with this incredibly dark and foreboding track of Bathory Elizabeth I think that's how it's spelled I don't know I might be wrong anyway this is a track that has a lot of backstory to it, as well as being such a unique and phenomenal performance in its own right. There's going to be a whole bunch to discuss here. <laughs> so for starters, for starters, uh, the track was written and recorded as a tribute to one Thomas Bjor Forsberg, better known as Corthorn, band leader of the black metal project Bathory. And the band is seen as one of the pioneers of the black metal genre, apparently, as well as having created the subgenre of Viking metal. Don't really know what that is, but it sounds pretty cool. Uh, this was due to them having many lyrics that focused on North, Norse mythology, apparently. But it was in 2004, though, that Fosberg was found deceased in his apartment in Stockholm at the age of 38, having passed away from a congen congenital heart defect. And as a result, then, the name of this track you know, is a direct tribute to, um, to the very band Bathory, as well as apparently a tribute to the Countess Elizabeth Bathory de Exed, uh, who inspired Bathory's name as a band, actually. And, you know, I, I, when, I, when I found out about, you know, uh, the Countess, basically, I did a bit of research into it, and there is some very interesting, you know, stories of our Countess Bathory, who apparently was a Hungarian noblewoman, an alleged serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> who was accused of torturing and killing, you know, hundreds of girls and women between 19, uh, 1590 and 1610. Now, I don't know, I don't know why I'm actually laughing, because it's actually well, fucking horrible, to be fair, but... You know, maybe because the Countess, you know, it's very weird, but... Anyway, it's an incredibly dark and macabre story, but it's easy to see why this inspired Fosberg to name his project Bathory, though, you know, um, you know, uh... I, from what my understanding of black metal, so much of it is interested in the dark and the macabre and just the horrificness of human nature, perhaps. And so, naming your band after you know this you know nasty serial killer and noble woman apparently makes sense. Makes sense. And so, the song itself. The song itself. Um, this is 16 minutes of incredibly unsettling atmospheric tension building as, you know, we open the track with these incredibly low-end bells and gongs performed by the one and only Oren Ombachi, producing this absolutely perfect opening that just feels so sinister and occult in its own right. And so I'll mention it here then, I'll mention it here. Um, no, uh, because these low-end sounds are something uh, that Ambarji produces is something I truly enjoy. I'd like to mention it here that, um, you know, it's something you hear a lot from Ambarji, especially when it comes to his own solo records. Like this was, um, 
my introduction to Aaron Ambarchi was listening to uh, the album Grapes from the Estate and then going on to listen to In the Pendulum's Embrace, which is one of my absolute favourite albums by Aaron Ambarchi. And especially on that latter album, there's so many of the same kind of sound effects that you hear on the very collaborations Ambarchi does with Sun on Black One, essentially, and some of the other albums as well, you know. He just does this incredible low-end sound, though, where it just drones and just goes boom, like stuff like that. And I love how it sounds, because it just creates this wonderful atmosphere to listen to. Of course, though, of course, though, um, the opening continues to push along, though, just ringing out with this, you know, the low-end murmurings, for the bass guitar start to screech into the scene with this really phenomenal presence and incredible sustain. But it's the vocal performance from Malefic that really sets this track apart from, you know, anything on this album, I would say. You know, Malefic's performance, it opens up with this incredibly deep, wheezing breathing that has such a level of panic buried deep within it before he starts his incredibly hollow and empty sounding screeches into the void. And so, on the record, Malefic is not credited as a vocalist, on this particular track of me, but actually credited as Calls From Beyond the Grey. And this is due to the fact that Malefic, a sufferer of claustrophobia, was nailed shut inside a coffin for his vocal tape. And knowing this, the performance literally sends shivers down my spine every single time I hear it. Just when I hear him doing the breathing at the very beginning, you know, before he even starts the singing, if you want to call it that, like, you can really hear the panic, the tension, and the absolute fear in his voice from being confined in such a tiny, horrific space. And man, I think it's one of the most unique vocal performances I've ever come across in anything, basically. And without a doubt, truly a highlight on this album. And I think it's truly perfect as well that the album has built up to this really final dark performance that's just so black in every respect of the word, right, you know? And I love the culmination of every element that's gone into this track, the vocal performance, the low-end sustained bass guitars just rigging out those heavy, heavy, powerful drones, and the mixture of various instruments just colliding together. And it just creates this you know, phenomenal existential performance that truly places us six feet beneath the very ground itself into the tiny confines of the coffin as we come to play our non-existence. So how are we gonna get this sound? Are we gonna, how we can put them in a closet, in a small space? Like, come on, gotta put them in a coffin, you know? See what kind of vocal uh, performance we can get and also what kind of tone we can get out of this. My goodness. Well, in my opinion, what a truly brilliant album from start to finish. I, I would argue that it's so disingenuous from what Sun truly represents within the world of drone, but you know, that they're so well known for. But I think it's a fantastic experiment that really blurs the lines between drone metal and black metal, and in a way just finds so much harmony between you know, the various similarities within the two different genres, as well as allowing both genres to, you know, um, push them both out, you know, further than their respective confines allow, I would say. And it's just this incredibly dark and heavy album that truly indulges in extreme darkness of metal music to create something that's just so overbearing and overloading as existentialism. And there's something so harsh and so bleak and yet so satisfying and indulgent about this kind of album that makes it truly stand out among Sun's discography that I would say it's definitely amongst one of their strongest releases on um, you know, amongst the many that they have though, you know, I mean, there's truly so many when it comes to Sun, and hence why I wanted to start here with, with Sun, because I, I just love this album. <laughs> and so, and so, I think we've come to the end of our episode of Weird Music today then, you know, I'm really glad to talk about one of my favourite bands out there, you know, the brilliant Sun, you know, they not, who have not only pushed out this incredible discography of dark foreboding drone metal music, but have also really experimented within the very genre itself to just push out you know new ideas and concepts within the very framework the genre is offering. And I love how so many different albums of theirs just see them experimenting in such weird and wild ways like you know White One and White Two, right? Two phenomenal albums that we might look at in future episodes. In any case though, it's definitely odd to have talked about Black One as the first Sun album on the channel, right? But it's just 
like I said, it's one that just inspired me to write a lot of words about, and so I really wanted to just dive into the meat of this one. <laughs> now, you might as well start with one of your favourites, right? So with that, I'd like to thank you for watching this rather weird episode of Weird Music, then. Um, if you're still watching and you have a favourite album by Sun, or even just a favourite track by Sun, please let me know in the comments below. With that, I wish you all the best. Take care, and bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.